Hi. Today I want to talk about a concept that I came across while I was working on my Game Boy Assembler, and that is atoms. Not these kind of atoms, but rather symbols as they're also known. An atom is basically a way to associate some kind of data, like a string or a byte array, with an identifier, the atom. So you can think of it almost as a key value pair that you would find in a hash map or a dictionary if you come from the .NET side of things, where the key is essentially the atom. So instead of copying the data around your program, you can just copy around the atom and then have a lookup function do the work for you to actually fetch that data so you can access it. This will reduce the memory footprint throughout your application. But in terms of C, why not just use pointers? They do essentially the same thing, right? Um, you have some kind of data somewhere, and instead of copying around, you just pass a pointer to that data, which essentially boils down to a 64-bit integer. But pointers come with a little bit of a downside. For example, what if the address of the data suddenly changes, for example, because you resize the buffer that it's at, or you might delete the object, then your pointer becomes invalid and essentially points to unused memory and it could contain all kinds of things, right? You would have to come up with like a mechanism to then figure out where in your program you reference that data after the address changed or the object has been deleted and then reassign uh, those addresses or essentially make them null pointers. And that is almost an impossible task to do, right? So atoms kind of abstract that away from you um, because you just have this string around and you pass it to a lookup function and the lookup function then can tell you, uh, well, hang on, that data has been deleted. Or if the address of that data changed, it doesn't really matter because the lookup table essentially keeps track of all of these things for you of where the data is in memory. So if an atom is essentially just a key to a value within the hash map, then what makes it so special? Well, the special thing here is that Windows actually ships with an atom table API. Atom tables are used in a bunch of different areas throughout Windows, but the two major ones I want to talk about is the global atom table and the local atom table. The global atom table is exactly what it sounds like. It's an atom table that can be used by any program running on your Windows machine. This global atom table was effectively used for the DDE protocol, which stands for Dynamic Data Exchange, which now sort of is obsolete and shouldn't be used anymore. But it was a way for programs to share data between each other. Because the amount of data that could be sent throughout the message broadcasting was quite limited, you could just effectively put the data in the global atom table and then just share the atom with a different program. Now, as you can imagine, because every process has access to this um, global atom table, it comes with a few vulnerabilities. One of them is the so-called atom bombing. Go figure. That is essentially a way of putting malicious code into the global atom table and then coaxing another program into executing that code. Now, how exactly this works is a bit out of scope for this video, um, but you can probably look it up online if you want to. The local atom table, however, is something that is only accessible for the current process that is running, so just for my application. It is effectively a hash map implementation provided by Windows that I can use for my own purposes. So instead of implementing my own hash map or finding some kind of hash map library online that I can use within my C program, I can just simply use the local atom table and effectively achieve the same thing. However, I would probably not use it for anything serious or in long term, but if it's just for like a quick lookup mechanism for a little example application that I write, why not? So with that said, let's have a look at the API. I have written a small Windows application without the C runtime that just has a few helper functions such as writing to the console, writing the value of an atom, either a local or a global atom, and just setting up the console in general. But we only have to focus on the main function down here. The Windows API documentation for the atom table API states that all the functionality should be in the kernel 32 lib. But if you're trying to use any of those API calls with just including the kernel 32 lib, you will quickly find out that it will just fail. It will constantly report an error saying access denied or something like that. 
Now, the way to circumvent that is to explicitly load the user32 DLL into your application or simply using any other user32 API call before you're using the atom table calls. For example, instead of load library, I could just open up a message box here or an actual Windows window. That kind of initializes, I guess, the atom table API. Otherwise, it's not possible to use it. So I think that has to be a bug either in the API itself or simply the documentation is wrong. So just remember to call load library or any user32 DLL function before you do anything with the Windows Atom tables. To add an atom into the local atom table, all I have to do is call add atom and pass in the string that I want to add to the atom table. I'm just gonna use foo here, but you can imagine any sort of larger strings. This function will return an atom which if we look into the definition is actually just a type def to a word and a word is just an unsigned short. So this is just basically an integer that it returns, which is now the ID for this string foo. Now, if adding the atom failed, the returned atom is just simply a value of zero. But instead of zero, I can also use invalid atom, which is just a define for zero. And if I get such an invalid atom, I can just write the last error message. Now to add another atom, I can just do the same call again. And now I have two atoms in my list. And we can actually verify that A and B are different atoms by printing out the atom integer value as well as the associated string with them from the table. And I have this little helper function to do this here, which is called write local atom value. So I pass in atom A and atom B. Now, write local atom value is simply calling the get atom name function, where you pass in an atom and provide a buffer so that the string that is associated with that atom can be copied into your buffer right here and you can then print out the value onto the console or do whatever you want with it. So this is essentially how you get the associated value with an atom. The size is 255 here because that is the maximum amount of bytes you can store in the atom table for any given atom. So if I build and run this now, You can see that it now prints uh, both of the atoms that I added into the atom table. So we have here the atom value as a hexadecimal value, and then the associated string that was stored within the atom table. Now to delete an atom, I would simply call delete atom. And in this instance, I'm gonna delete atom foo. And just to prove that deletion worked, I'm just gonna use the find atom function where I'm simply passing in the string that I'm looking for to see if it is stored already within the atom table or not. If it can find the atom, it will return the atom value associated with the string or otherwise it will return an invalid atom. And in this instance, I'm just gonna write atom has been deleted onto the console. And as you can see, um, I'm calling delete atom A, and then I'm trying to find foo within the atom table, but it's no longer existing. So I'm gonna print atom has been deleted. Now, one thing to mention is that adding atoms is not case sensitive. So if I add the same atom twice, but with different casing, atom A and atom B will essentially be the same. And I can prove that down here by printing out both values. And then I'm gonna delete one of those atoms and try to find it. And we'll see what happens. 
So as you can see, both atoms have the exact same value and point to the same string, even though they have different casing. What you also notice is after I deleted the atom, I could still find it within the list. That is because every single atom within the atom table is also reference counted. That means whenever I add something to the atom table that already exists, the reference count of that value will be incremented by one. And if I then call delete atom, it will just be decremented by one. If the reference count is not zero, then the value still remains within the table. It will only be removed once the reference count reaches zero. So in my case here, I would actually have to call delete atom A twice because I've added it two times into the list. Now this is not so important for the local atom table, but it becomes quite important for the global atom table because you do not want to delete a value for another application. So if we have program A, for example, that adds the string foo into the atom table, and then we have program B that also adds foo to the atom table. Now, if B suddenly, you know, deletes the table because the program is about to be closed, then removing it from the atom table would essentially break program A because program A knows nothing about the deletion, right? It just assumes the value would still be there and is valid. So that's why reference counting has been implemented, that you don't run into these kind of issues. Of course, you can still kind of run to these issues if one program calls the lead too many times or whatever, but it was essentially a, a way of trying to limit these issues. Now, I have mentioned that an atom is basically just an integer. And whenever you add a string into the atom table, the returned atom will always be in the range of hexadecimal C000 to hexadecimal FFFF. So this means you can put around 16,000 um, string values into the atom table. But that leaves a whole nother range just sitting there. So what is that used for? So essentially every atom from hexadecimal one to hexadecimal BFFF is reserved for something called integer atoms. Now that simply means instead of adding strings to the atom table, I can add integer numbers to the atom table. So let's say 42 and 55. However, the atom APIs do not have an overload to just pass in integers. So there is a little macro called make int atom and this will essentially transform the past integer into a very special form of string let me show you by building and running this now as you can see i have two atoms and they are in the lower range as expected and the value is an actual string with a pound sign and then the number. So this is a very special way of encoding integers for the atom table. Now I do not know what I would use integer atoms for. Um, I assume they have some historical reason. I mean, the range allows for almost 50,000 different integer atoms. I mean, there must have been a reason why they allocated so much space for these, right? Uh, if you know of a use case, let me know in the comments, please. Now let me remove atom B and just have one atom here. So this was the local atom table. The global atom table has to be accessed with slightly different functions. And that is just by putting the word global in front of all these API calls. So add atom becomes global add atom, delete atom becomes global delete atom, find atom, becomes global find atom and then instead of calling the get atom name function right here i'm going to call global get atom name now i do not have any interesting use cases for the global atom table at the moment but what we can do is because this is simply an integer. We can print out all the values that are currently stored within the global atom table on my system. For that, I'm just gonna write a for loop. And we're going to start 
all the way at the end of the maximum allowed atom value. And we're going to decrement this atom until we reach the start of the integer atoms. I do not want to print out all the integer atoms of the global atom table because it's just a bunch of numbers. I do not find it particularly interesting. And then I'm just going to call write global atom value, which if you remember is calling global get atom name for every single atom. And if I build and run this now, you can see it prints out all the strings that are stored in the global atom table on my particular system. Now you can run this code on your own machine to see what's in there, but yeah, basically a bunch of programs that are using this to store certain strings and maybe sharing them between each other. And that is the Windows Atom Table API. Now, as I mentioned before, it's not something I would use long term for my program, but if I ever need just a quick lookup mechanism, I certainly will be using this API. Why not? Let me know down in the comments what you think about this and whether you'd be consider using it for your own applications. And that's about it. Thank you for watching. Bye.